I'm uh, Deb Mirator. I'm a volunteer on the Irondequoit Conservation Board, and I want to welcome you and thank you all uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, so we're having a uh, talk about invasive species that bug us and beyond invasives, outstanding Native American plants, native plants for upstate New York. And we have uh, two speakers tonight. We, first, we're going to have Patty Wakefield Brown. She's from the Invasive Species Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator at the Finger Lake in Institute, Finger Lakes Prism at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And then we're going to have Brian Eschenauer, and he's with uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension in the Pest Management Program. Um, each um, um, PowerPoint will be about 45 minutes, and then you know we'll have some questions and answers. Uh, I just want to let you know also that we are recording this live. It's being streamed on Facebook, and then it will also be um, put on ICAT TV at some point in time. And again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Deb. Hi, everybody. I know I know a lot of you. I'm not used to using microphones because I have a very loud voice anyway, but I'm told I have to use it, so, so I will. Um, but hi to everyone. I'm glad you could make it. I know it's a hot night out there, and... Uh, we got a little air conditioning in here, so that's nice. So as Deb said, my name is Patty Wakefield Brown, and I work at the Finger Lakes Institute, which is part of Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva. And we are a department within the college, but we're housed in a house on Main Street. And we have a couple labs in our building, and we have students come and do a lot of research um, for water quality in the Finger Lakes region, work with fish and pollutants and things of that nature. And um, we also house the PRISM there. And I don't know if you guys know the, um, we're going to talk about habitat snatchers here, you guys. Um, I don't know if you all know about the Finger Lakes prism. Do you guys know about prisms? Some of you know what the prisms are. So the prism, I'll give you a brief, uh, quick one. Prism stands for Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And there's eight of them across the state. And I work at the Finger Lakes uh, prism. So we cover 17 counties within the Finger Lakes region. We're the largest prism by county in the state. So there's eight of them across the state and we're funded by the DEC. And what we do is we all work together on a statewide level to fight, you know, to talk about invasive species and to stop the spread. And for instance, you know, Long Island down here has lots of invasive species because they have a lot of shipping, right? They got a lot of stuff going on down in Long Island. And some of those things that I'll talk about today are in Long Island, but they're not up here yet. So we want to stop the spread, right? So we all communicate together. We work with the DEC, we work with integrated pest management, we work with Cornell, we work with master gardeners, which I see many of you in the crowd right now. Um, so we all work together um, to fight the spread of invasive species. So we work with management, and I do education and outreach with um, kindergarten through 12th grade. I work with college students, I work with homeowners and landowners and municipalities, highway departments. So it's kind of across the board and it's all about invasive species. So it's aquatic and terrestrial invasive species. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about what invasive species are for those of you that aren't quite sure. So an invasive species, this is kind of the, you know, the legal definition, if you will. <clears throat> of what an invasive species is. But invasive species is not native. It's not from here, it's from somewhere else. It has no natural enemies to keep it in check, right? Um, you know, ecosystems have this balance in nature and you get these invasives that come in and they kind of knock things out of balance. And so they're not from here and they cause or may cause economic environmental harm or harm to hu harmful to human health. So when we talk about human health and harmful to human health, I talk about giant hogweed. If you know what giant hogweed is, it's a plant that has a really bad oil that can burn your skin. Quite dangerous. It's nice to make people aware of what that is. Um, economic harm, certainly. You know, economy is our money. These invasives come in. They, they uh, affect our tourism. They affect our water and all of our ecosystems and our parks and our, our, um, all of that stuff. And then it also causes environmental harm to habitat. Right? You've got these invasives moving in, and they're taking over the habitat of our native species. They're c competing with them for food and habitat. So has anybody ever seen this? This is called the invasion curve. And I like to show this, like you don't have to be a scientist to understand this. 
but a lot of times we use this in trying to manage invasive species. Um, so just quickly, so we've got an area of infestation, we've got time going on, we've got money, because this stuff all costs money to try to control invasive species. So right about here, you know, so let's just use zebra mussels, for example. I think everybody kind of knows what a zebra mussel is. They're pretty much here for good, right? We can't get rid of them. But when they first started coming around in the early 90s, um, you know, we saw them around. I guess nobody knew what they were. But right then, when we started recognizing them, that was a good time to try to control them, try to get rid of them, right? Good time for intervention to eradicate, which means make them go away. So that didn't happen, right? So time goes on, time goes on. Now we're over here on the curve with um, zebra mussels. So now all we can do is manage them, and it costs lots and lots of money to manage for invasive species. So if we can catch invasive species, if we've got something that we know is like right down in here, we're like, okay, we can manage it. It's small infestations, let's, let's work on that. So it's kind of like what we use. Um, they have no natural enemies. They have a high rate of reproduction, whether it's a plant, whether it's an animal, it can be an insect, it can be an organism, okay? High rate of reproduction, great adaptations that help them um, survive. So in the plant world, which many of you are gardeners, um, you've got these come in, they can handle high drought levels, they don't need a lot of water, they don't need a lot of sun, so they're highly adaptable. And at the end of the day, they affect our biodiversity and uh, threaten native species by outcompeting. So that's kind of the rundown on, hmm, there we go. So we got some indirect impacts of invasive species, you know, to our food webs, to nutrient availability. Um, you know, halves, harmful algal blooms are happening in our waterways. Some of that has to do with zebra mussels, and I won't get into that. Harmful algal blooms are not invasive, but they are affecting our water quality in most of the Finger Lakes. Um, you know, it certainly affects tourism, agriculture, all of that stuff. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and I do want to say this right now, we're in the week of Invasive Species Awareness Week. I don't know if you guys have heard about Invasive Species Awareness Week, but every single year, from in the first week in July usually, it's Invasive Species Awareness Week across the whole state. So all of the PRISMs have events going on in their, in their regions about invasive species. So for instance, we have 52 events going on between the 7th and the 13th of July, just within our Finger Lakes region, our Finger Lakes prism. So if you go to our website, you can see there's, there's a list of all the prisms and you can see what's going on around the whole state as far as invasive species. Um, and, uh, and trying to stop the spread and raising awareness. So this is the sixth year we've done Invasive Species Awareness Week. And this year, every year there's a slogan. And I think our slogan this year is, explore, observe, and report. So, you know, we're all out there, right? We're feet on the ground. We're the ones out there hiking and gardening and, and um, you know, out in their kayaks. We're out there recreating. We're eyes on the ground. And so go out there and explore, but certainly be mindful of what you're seeing because we really make a difference at the end of the day to report these invasives. I mean, they can, you know, pathways of invasions, how do they get here? Well, some of the, in, some of the invasives come in the ballast water of ships. They come over in you know, packing from other countries. They come in many different ways. Um, and this is just many, many ways that they come. You know, we are, we are certainly a vector for invasive species. And, you know, we've got to have things, right? So things come from other countries. Um, but for recreation, for boats, we have the clean, drain, dry message, right? You've got boat stewards sitting at boat launches checking boats for aquatic invasive species and to stop the spread. And it's also teaching people better management practices. It's Some people don't even know about it and they recreate in the water all the time. So um, if we can spread the awareness, you know, we're gonna make a difference. So there's Smokey Bear, who I love to death. My, everybody knows who Smokey is, right? And everybody knows what his message is, right? Smokey says, only you can prevent forest fires, right? So he's the steward of the planet. Um, I think Smokey just turned 73, so I think we all know him. <laughs> Some kids, usually kids know, know who Smokey is and they know what his message is. And that's my time to say, Smokey is a steward. A steward is someone that takes care of something, right? <clears throat> so 
we have all of these slogans, right? Clean, drain, dry, don't move firewood. Um, you know, give insp invasive species the brush off. We have boot brushes stationed um, at, in the front of trailheads, right? To get the seeds off of your boots so you don't take seeds from one area to another. Um, ride, clean, you know, ride, clean, go. You know, check your tires on where you're going. Dispose of your bait properly. Don't throw your bait back in the water, right? So we have all these slogans that cost a lot of money, but all you have to do is look at a clean, drain, dry, and you know what that means, right? You look at Smokey and you know what that means. Take care of the forest, right? So <clears throat> the, the money that's put into these, these uh, slogans really do pay off because all you need is a picture and it tells you the story. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about some some invasives, and I put this on here because everybody always asks me, look at the master gardeners, they're all laughing over there. <clears throat> everybody knows what a marmorated, brown marmorated stink bug is, right? These things are crazy. My cat loves to eat them, which is awesome. Um, you know, eat away. Um, brown marmorated stink bug. Um, you know, they, the only, the good thing is that um, they don't, um, they can't mate inside, which is awesome, right? So if you got them in the house, you know, we're going to kill them all or they're going to die, right? I don't take them and put them back outside. I just kill them. Some spiders I put back outside. These guys I do not. Um, so, you know, they single generation every year, but if we have really warm spring and summer, they might have a second batch of a brood. So, you know, think about climate change, right? Climate change is real. Climate change is making a difference in how these invasive species behave, right? So what we think we know about species is changing because our climate is changing. <clears throat> and they seek overwintering sites. <clears throat> so they're actually an agricultural pest, right? And uh, when I tell kids that, they're like, wow, they're all over the house. I was just talking to kids this morning. Um, but they're an agricultural pest, and this is kind of what they do. You know, they really wreak havoc on the agricultural um, industry. And now, you know, we've all... You know, we're building houses everywhere, right? So this shows you, uh, this is a pretty cool map, shows you distribution, but then this shows you the impacts, right? So where are we, okay? Agriculture and nuisance problems, but look at severe agriculture and nuisance problems in PA, West Virginia, Virginia. You know, PA is right below us. You know, these invasive species don't know boundaries, right? They don't know state lines. <clears throat> So they can produce, I didn't know this, but they can produce allergic reaction. You cut, you know, you put them on your skin, right? So they have this defense. They stink. Um, they don't reproduce inside, which is awesome, right? That's really good news because, you know, you're thinking, are they laying eggs everywhere? And, uh, you know, to keep them out, you just, they get in those little cracks. They find a place to overwinter. And then it gets, we get a warm day. Even in the wintertime, we get a warm day. Bam. You know, those lady beetles or whatever we call them. And brown marmorated stink bugs come out. So, so, you know, keep your house closed up, I guess is the, the, best, the best advice. So we're gonna talk about some pests. I do wanna take a, take a moment to tell you that over here on this table, I brought a bunch of handouts, okay? Feel free to take them. I brought a bunch of swag, we call this swag, all these nice little gifts, right? Um, invasive species warrior buttons. I think we can all be warriors when we leave here today. You master gardeners can take extra. Um, and I also have, I have these specimens of the insects, okay? So for instance, right now we're gonna talk about the Asian longhorn beetle. The Asian longhorn beetle lives in Long Island. He does not live here yet. That's a perfect example of invasive species not being here. There's pamphlets here too. Um, native to, Ch you know, China, Korea, Japan, Asia, you know, they, they definitely just come from somewhere else. Um, these guys like maple trees. Um, and if you see on that specimen, it shows you the frass, right? Shows you the exit hole from the adult there. Shows you what the tree's gonna look like if it's infested with the Asian longhorn beetle. So we tell you about this stuff because it's not here yet, but when it gets here, we want to know where it is so that we can try to stop the spread, right? Catch it early, catch it soon. Um, so it looks a lot like the white spotted Sawyer. You know, the antenna on Asian longhorn beetle is longer. Um, you know, it doesn't have this white spot right here. I mean, if I saw that white sort white, I wouldn't know the difference if I just saw them, you know? But, you know, 
they, the DEC wants to know. They want you to report it. Um, this shows you, you know, it starts to show three to four years after there's an infestation, you start, you know, you start seeing signs of it in your trees, right? So that's a long time. So <clears throat> if we know what to look for, you know, the size of the holes, well, there's a lot of boring beetles. So you see holes in your trees a lot of the time, right? But we just need to pay attention. Um, this is a pretty cool uh, map. Shows you kind of where it is. Um, again, you know, Long Island is just loaded, right? So we want to stop that spread. So what they do is they have a lot of commercials on TV, like right about now, July, August, because you know bugs get in your pool filter, right? So they have commercials and say, hey, check your pool filter for this pest, right? It's a good way to, to see if you have them. And then again, all of these, um, all of these invasives I'm going to talk about, the DEC want you to report about these. Um, or you can um, report to the PRISM, too, you know, because we all work together. Um, emerald ash borer. So you guys know about the emerald ash borer, right? And the ash trees are all going, right? Um, I have a live specimen of the emerald ash borer. I have the larva and the adult here. And then I also have on this piece of wood, it's got, we colored it red to show you the D mark. That's the exit hole. So if you have a D-shaped hole in your tree, that's like, indicative of emerald ash borer. So when people say, and this is just the trailings from the larva that eat under the bark. So when people say, geez, you know, I think I have emerald ash borer, how do I know? Well, you know, there's all these ways to know if you have it. Those exit holes um, are certainly one way. And so, you know, we're used to seeing this picture of this beetle that looks huge and it's really very quite small. If you see the, the specimen I have over there, um, one year cycle, it comes, it emerges under the bark, okay, in between the, the tree and the bark, and it eats all the cambium layer, which is all the good juicy fleshy stuff that feeds the tree, right? So if that girdles that tree, if it eats that cambium layer around the tree, there's no nutrients going up to the top of the tree, so the tree's gonna die at the top first. The tree's gonna start shooting out branches at the bottom, which trees normally don't do that. Um, I, have, I have some good pictures, I think, of, uh, well, this shows you how to identify an ash tree, okay? Tree identification is not easy. Thank God for Google now. You can pretty much figure anything out, right? I had to go to school to learn it. Um, you know, it shows you the, the Samaras, the fruit, and the compound leaf, and the, you know, the diamond shape pattern on the bark. So once you know what an ash tree is, you like never forget. Like I remembered this, what this was. And this shows you what it's going to look like if you do have it. So look at what it's doing. It's shooting out all these branches at the bottom, right? Trees don't normally do that, but it's latch stitch effort to try to survive, right? You're going to see all this up here in the corner on the right. That's called blonding. And you'll see this now that you know what it looks like. You know, you're driving, you'll see all this blonding on the tree. You know, there's that D-shaped hole. Um, and then you're going to see this. So, you know, people, you know, and then I think, you know, I can't talk out of school, but I think that, like, some trees are immune to it, right? So some of your ash trees, like, are dying, and then it's like, how come this tree is not dying? And so I think they're trying to collect seed from some of those trees. Just, you know, maybe those trees are have some kind of immunity. There is an over-the-counter thing that you can do. You can pay to have them inject stuff into your tree, which is quite costly. I know I don't have that kind of money. I might love my trees, but I don't have that kind of money. So it's very costly. You know, and you can call the DEC or you can call a landscaper and ask them, and they could probably give you information on how to, you know, how to maybe go about fighting this. But I did hear that, you know, if your tree falls on your house and it's because it's dead from an emerald ash borer, insurance won't cover it because it's something that we all know is here now. So if you have a dead tree, then it's your, it's your problem to take care of it. So what if I'm 85 years old and I have a dead ash tree in my yard and it falls on my house? I mean, so it's kind of a drag, right? But it's really good if you can find someone to come and cut it down and then tell them they can have the wood. <laughs> so, so that's what I suggest to people. And then this is just a distribution map. So with all of these, I'm just going to kind of show you a distribution map. And it's kind of cool to see where everything is. And when I talked about climate change before, you know, 
a lot of things that live down south are moving upward. They're moving north because our temperature is changing, right? So it's more, it's more adaptable for them. So that's kind of scary. <clears throat> so we're always on the lookout. Like, you know, we think, oh, this hatches in June. Well, maybe it's going to start hatching in May, you know? So it was found in 2009. And so here we are, um, here we are, you know, 10 years later, and our ash trees are just decimated. So it's really changing the structure of our forest. Then we have hemlock woolly adelgid. You guys know what this is? It's affecting our hemlock trees. So hemlock trees grow on the north facing slopes of tributaries, creeks and streams. So they do a number of things, right? They're beautiful, but they keep the water cool, right? A lot of fish and macroinvertebrate, things that live in cool water benefit from that. Um, they stop erosion. If you've got them on the north face of a slope and it, we have rain, they're going to stop the erosion, all the sediment from going into the water. Many, many things that, um, that our hemlocks do. <clears throat> so these are hemlock woolly adelgids. When I was in school, my professor told me they're little tiny bugs with little white furry tutus on, right? <laughs> so I think that, and I still think about that. <clears throat> so um, right now we have a hemlock woolly adelgid initiative, and I brought some paper, some pamphlets for from them, and uh, certainly take one and really go to their website and check it out. They got some really awesome things that they're doing. Mark Whitmore works at Cornell. He's a um, scientist there, and he just opened an insectivore, and he is breeding um, biocontrol to try to fight these, um, these insects. So the way to identify um, a hemlock is if you look on the underside of the branch, you can see two white lines on the, the leaf. This is a leaf. And uh, then you know it's a hemlock. Because, you know, you look at it and say, oh, it's a conifer. It's a Christmas tree. I don't know. It's a pine tree. Um, and then it's got these little, you know, these little acorns or little buds, cones, yeah. So this is a distribution map. And we just highlighted it because this is our region. This is the Finger Lakes region of the prism. Okay, so we just highlighted that. Um, but you can see, look at the spread, right? What's going on here, right? <laughs> so we want to stop the spread. So look at Western New York. They don't have too much right now, right? So Mark Whitmore has found these beetles, the silver flies and this laracobius, and um, he's breeding them. So that's biocontrol. So biocontrol takes a long time. He's been working with this for, you know, I don't know, 10 years. It takes a long time and a lot of money to use biocontrol because you don't want to put something out there that's going to kill everything else, right? I mean, we've done that before. I think we've made a few mistakes. So, so you know, we live and we learn, right? Um, but we do, um, you know, certainly like everything, they want you to report it. Um, IMAP invasives, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later too, about reporting invasives. But there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and it looks really, really hopeful um, with some of this biocontrol. It's really, really looking, looking very hopeful. And there's the New York State Hemlock Initiative. So Carrie Marshner is the, the woman that runs that program, and they're doing awesome, awesome work. So I know for a while there they were looking for people that maybe had stands of hemlocks on their property that wanted to maybe try to use their, um, this biocontrol. So, you know, go to the website, take one of those sheets and just read about it. It's really, really interesting. It's great science that's going on. And so, you know, the more we can educate people, right, the more we know where these infestations are, the better. How about oak welt? You guys, this is like sad news here. Sorry. <laughs> um, I have some flyers about oak wilt as well. So oak wilt is a fungus, okay, um, and it's only been around since 1994. So what it does, like, so, you know, I, I tell people, I tell kids trees hold hand underground. They really do. Trees are all connected, right? And so the, the, the most common way this occurs is through root grafting from root to root of, of trees. That's how they share this fungus. And uh, the picnic beetle up there, I guess that's really what they call it, a picnic beetle. Um, if there's an open spore on the tree, um, He's going to smell rotten fruit. He's going to land on that, that 
fungus, he's going to have spores on his feet and maybe could transport it. So that's another way, but more often it's because of this root grafting. So you can see up in the corner on the right, um, A and B, right, white oak and red oak. So the way I learned how to tell the difference between white oak and red oak, and this is not racial by any means, but it makes me remember, white oak has round curved edges, like white man has bullet, Native American, red man has arrows, sharp and pointy. So the red oak has pointy leaves and the white oak has rounded leaves. So that's how I learned it and I always will remember that forever. So, <clears throat> um, so nearby trees can be affected. Um, I think um, red oaks die much faster than white oaks. Like they can die within, I think like months, okay? White oaks take much longer. So red oaks are more susceptible to this. Um, and there, it shows you some of the fungus. Some of the uh, symptoms, you get the brown coloration on the leaves like you see there, and your tree's gonna start dropping. The woman in Canandaigua, they found this in Canandaigua, and the woman noticed her oak tree was dropping leaves, like, and it shouldn't be dropping leaves. And so she called someone, and they came out, and sure enough, it had oak wilt in Canandaigua. So it was over here, look at poor Long Island again, right? But it was over here a couple of years ago, and they, they, um, they contained that, okay, and they got rid of the tree. And then it was in Canandaigua a couple of years ago, and uh, it was one tree, and they had to dig this huge trench around the whole, I don't even know how far out, but they had to dig a trench to cut all the roof grafting, right? And they used this big plow here to, uh, so it doesn't spread to other trees. So they secluded that tree in that infestation, and they took the wood and they chipped it. You know, they didn't cut the wood and take it anywhere else. Um, and so that was pretty scary because it's right by the high tour management area, right? That's all woods. It was very, very scary. And who doesn't love oak trees, right? I have one acre of land, and I have like 25 oak trees on my property. Oak trees are awesome. The grandfather, they call them. Very wise trees, they say. Um, so then there was another site in Bristol, South Bristol, two properties, okay? One property had five trees and one property had 15 trees. Um, they had to take, um, I can't remember the numbers, but then, for instance, in Glenville, there had three infected trees. They had to take 90 trees out as a buffer. So, you know, they have to go as far as the root system is going to be to try to make sure they're getting rid of it. So, you know, you might only have one tree, but you got to get rid of a whole bunch to have that buffer. And they had to quarantine 46 landowners in that area. So they feel like they've, they've uh, quarantined this area in, um, in South Bristol. But this is something they're really on the lookout for. So, you know, pay attention to your oak tree and take, you know, take one of those um, flyers. And I think the rest of my presentation is going to be about this guy right here call it a guy, it could be a girl. Do you guys know about spotted lanternfly? Spotted lanternfly is the newest insect that, so it's 7.30. Um, spotted lanternfly lives in Pennsylvania, does not live here. I do have specimens, I have live specimens, well, preserved, I would say live, preserved specimens in the, in the jars, and I have a couple of these. So feel free to look at that. So it has different instars, which means different stages of its life, right? An insect has instars. So, you know, it starts out as an egg, it's this, then it has an instar life like this, and then it turns into an adult. So the spotted lanternfly likes to eat over 70 different host plants, um, native to China and Vietnam. It is in Korea as well, totally decimated Korea. Um, it likes the tree of heaven. Tree of heaven is an invasive tree that looks a lot like sumac. So if you know what sumac is, it's around railroad tracks. Sumac is pretty much everywhere. Um, I think they brought it here for erosion control or something. And uh, so it likes tree of heaven, which looks a lot like sumac, but it, it does like tree of heaven. <coughs> it likes grapes, it likes hops, and it likes apple trees. So here we are in the Finger Lakes region, right? This is a total candy dish for these guys. And so it's very alarming. Um, and we want to know, we want to know if this, this guy shows up. Um, so it's a plant hopper. It's not a butterfly and it's not a moth. It's a plant hopper. 
You know, it's about an inch long, an adult resting stage. This is it with its wings open, okay? Um, it's got a piercing sucking mouth part right here that they pierce into the tree or the vine. They don't eat the fruit, they go for the vine and they suck the sap, the good stuff out of there. And then they excrete a sugary, they call it honeydew. So they excrete something that gets, um, that gets on all the surrounding plants. And, uh, and, and I'll show you some pictures of that. So the first to the third instar, late April to mid July, you're gonna see them be black and white. So the first to the third instar. So that's three different stages. So it just molts into the next stage. For those three stages, it stays black and white. They're really beautiful. They're totally cool. They look like a mechanical dog. Actually, when they do, 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 they run along and they, they pop like tiddlywinks. They jump everywhere. Um, this is the fourth instar. It turns into the red and white before it turns into the flying adult, okay? This is what, you know, this is nothing on a tree down in Pennsylvania. It's crazy. And they're easy to identify, right? They don't look like a, like a ladybug. I mean, they're very easy to identify. Pretty crazy looking, right? So there's that piercing sucking mouth part. Does it look like an alien, right, you guys? Crazy. So they're phloem feeders. So they pierce into the, you know, into the phloem, right? That's what feeds the, the plant. They pierce into that and they excrete something that helps the phloem flow quicker. So if you've got lots of them on grapevines and they're all putting this substance into that to make it flow, think about how much they're hammering on that vine, right? So they're doing lots and lots of damage. And then as they're doing that, and they swarm feed too. So as they're doing that, they're excreting this honeydew, which is like a sugary substance. So it gets on the leaves and it gets on the fruit and then it turns into um, like mold, right? And then, so the fruit is not viable. You can't really sell the fruit. And that attracts all kinds of other critters, ants and bees and other insects that can really decimate the plants. How am I doing ladies? Good? <laughs> so this is a female and she's laying eggs. Okay, she lays these rows of eggs and then she covers them with this waxy substance and they overwinter. Great adaptation, right? She covers them with wax and they overwinter. So this is what it looks like from far away. If you're walking around in the woods and you see all that, um, you're gonna say, hey, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's spotted lanternfly. I mean, it looks like gypsy moth kind of too. So these are eggs that she did not cover but they could still be viable, even though she did not cover them. So this is what it looks like in November, and then look at it in March, it just looks like dried mud, right? And this is a really good, really good visual. I got two different ones that just show you, you know, first to third in stars in late April, right? She's laying her eggs in October and June, and then she's the adult during July and December, and that's when she's feeding, okay? And again, you know, we think the first instar is going to hatch in May or June. Well, if we've got really hot weather, she might hatch soon, right? They might hatch sooner. So this is all, this could certainly change. This just shows them feeding, right? So they're not on the fruit, they're on the vine. And this is some of the excretion. So when I went down to Pennsylvania to the quarantine zone, I was seeing this and, and I'm walking along and I see all this, the leaves look all wet and they look up and they're everywhere. And so it's just everywhere on the undergrowth, right? So it, they have this two-fold punch, right? So it is really affecting life in Pennsylvania. Um, so, and I'm gonna show you a map. In Berks County, Pennsylvania um, is where it originated. So this is just a tree, you know, kids aren't out here playing. If you, if you Google um, spotted lanternfly, there's some videos and it shows like the guy just goes up to the tree and goes like this and they'll just fall off. I mean, it's crazy. This here is all the honeydew excretion underneath, right? That's gonna turn into sooty mold. It's gonna attract other insects. And then this here, so this is somebody's deck. They power wash this step, but look at this happens every day. Every day she's got all this honeydew on her deck. They can't spend time outside. You know, what if you wanna sell your house? Who's gonna wanna buy your house, right? 
So it's affecting many, many different things. <clears throat> so this shows you, this shows you, so yeah, this goes up to 2017. Um, this shows you Berks County, where it started in 2014 is the yellow, the orange is 2015, 2016 is the blue, and the green is 2017. So you'll see how they've done a really good job to keep it quarantined, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about biocontrol at the end. There's a lot that, that is unknown about this insect. So they're talking to researchers in China, right, in Korea, in Vietnam, where they've been dealing with this insect. Little kids say to me, well, how come you just don't go over there and get the bug that kills it and bring it over here? Great idea. Biocontrol, but that costs a lot of money and time, right? And it's never that easy. <clears throat> so they've done a really good job to keep it really contained and quarantined in Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, this here shows um, the, the red is where they found it, the blue is where they surveyed and did not find it. So um, a little bit has changed, but really not too much. And they quarantine by township down there, not by county. Think about for, I think for the Emerald Ash Borer here, we quarantine by county, so think about you know, our counties are huge, right? So they quarantine by township to really keep it a little bit um, closer. This is a map, and don't be alarmed. There's a new one that came out in June of 2019 that I do not have. And I think there was one found over in Erie um, in New York. So this shows you the um, initial infestation and how it radiated out. <clears throat> new Jersey now has a quarantine, okay? Delaware now has a quarantine. Um, and the ones that were found in New York were all like, they were dead in uh, pallets, dead in warehouse. They found one in Yates County <coughs> that, um, that was dead, and now they've surveyed. They went back this spring and surveyed again. They're looking for eggs. They're, they're handing out flyers to neighbors in the surrounding area to raise awareness. Because, you know, this could be here and really be flying under the radar, quote, unquote you know, for a little while, and all of a sudden we're going to start seeing more, right? So we do not have any infestations in New York at this time, but we do have an incident command system here in New York, what we're dealing with, um, the way we're dealing with it. We have uh, the DEC and Ag and Markets at the top, and everybody else working goes down. This is everybody that works together. We all work together on invasive species together <coughs> to try and... Uh, to stop the spread. So it's an incident command system in place. We all educate about it. We all educate the same. We all have the same message because it's really important, right, to have consistent messaging and consistent ways to report. So in Pennsylvania, for truckers, they have to have a um, permit for spotted lanternfly. They have to take a course. They have to know about it. They have to have paperwork in their truck. And they have to have this permit, right? Quarantine zone, 13 county area. I think it's 14 counties now, okay? Um, they need to have certification for exporting any goods out of Pennsylvania. We have an external quarantine in place in New York. Egg and Markets is conducting vehicle inspections randomly at road stops. They have some drones so they can look at the tops of trucks. How about rail cars, right, sitting down in Pennsylvania? Just uh, this, this insect likes to lay its eggs on rusty things, right, on blocks, on a lot of things, but rusty stuff... Rail cars are really good for that. How about campers? People have campers parked in their yard, and now they're all coming to New York to, you know, to camp, right? And so it's eventually going to come here, but we want to know when it gets here, and we want to stop it, okay? So that's why we educate about it, because we are all the ones that are out there. Kids are the ones that are out there playing, riding their bikes. <clears throat> so um, the regulatory plan, um, there's checkpoints. We talk to nursery growers, right? Anybody that's getting any kind of shipment in, dealer inspections, stone yards, they believe it came over in China, from China on stone that someone had delivered to their home originally. Christmas tree vendors, um, warehouses, and rail yards. <clears throat> so biological control. So this is, you know, this is all really new. There's lots of research going on. I went down for two years in a row. I went down to Pennsylvania to Penn State. They're the leaders in really doing all this research down in Pennsylvania with um, China and Vietnam. 
And uh, when I was there, there was 10 other states at the table. We were educators, we were scientists, we were researchers. Everybody's at the table learning about this together and how do we fight this as a team, right? So this is a biological control that's a parasitoid and it is known to eat, um, it's a parasitoid for gypsy moth, okay? But it is known to eat um, spotted lanternfly eggs. So that's really good. But then we got this new thing and I'm sure some of you know about this. There are two native fungal pathogens, um, Betcoa major and Borrelia bassini, la, 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 la. yeah, <laughs> but they're fungus, right? And so they're finding these. I just saw a webinar two days ago um, from Pennsylvania, and uh, they go and they check these vineyards, and they're finding all of these spotted lanternflies with this fungus that's attaching them to the tree, which is really awesome. It's killing them. They're la they find them on the ground. But it, it, you know, think about this. So if you're a fungus, you have spores that go release in the wind, right? So you're on this spotted lantern fly, and it's something that's within them that comes out and actually sticks them to the tree. But then think about that. Then your, your spores can just go, right? But it's killing these spotted lantern flies. So they're doing lots and lots of um, research on this right now. It is very hopeful. It is very exciting. It is very exciting because you get grape growers that, you know, say last year they got hit with the spotted lantern fly. So then they treat that with pesticide, right? And then two weeks later, you've got a whole nother gang of spotted lantern fly coming through. And so then, you know, how often can you treat, right? So they're seeing a yield, a percentage of yield every year um, gone down in their grape production, right? So it's affecting you know, it's affecting people's livelihood in, in such a negative way. <clears throat> so there's ongoing research all the time. We know it needs tree of heaven to at one point in its life, but does it need the tree of heaven to um, reproduce, right? There's all these unknowns that they don't know about. So they're doing, you know, how do they really feed? What attracts them? How do they communicate with each other? They don't fly well, but they, they jump very well when they're, you know, younger, the instars, and then they don't really fly well. They fly up and the wind disperses them too, okay? If they flew really well, they'd probably be here by now, <laughs> right? Um, you know, so that's, that's another reason why it was easy to contain them. Um, but there's a lot of stuff going on. There's so much science going on. They're dissecting these things and they're figuring it out. Um, tree of Heaven is an invasive tree and it has um, toxic chemicals. So maybe that, you know, that comes into play. Who knows? Brian probably knows more about this than I do. <clears throat> but, you know, the biggest thing is <clears throat> knowing how to, uh, knowing how to identify it. You know, that's a take home message a DEC wants. Know how to identify this thing. Now we have Google. I keep saying Google, but you know what? It's so awesome. When we were young, you had to look it up in an encyclopedia. And if you couldn't spell it, good luck, right? I can remember forever searching. Um, <clears throat> so if you see it and report it, if you see an adult, if you see a nymph, put it in a baggie, put it in the freezer and call the DEC, call Cornell, call Integrative Pest Management, call the PRISM, call someone. But really the DEC, you know, there's one chief in town. They want to know where this, this insect is. <clears throat> so, um, if you go to New York State Integrative Pest Management to the Spotted Lanternfly Resources, uh, Tim Weigel over there, he's been doing webinars. So there's so many really good webinars and YouTube videos, so much information on their website. There's a checklist there. So if you're going to go to PA, like what to do, like keep your windows rolled up if you go to PA. I mean, there's all these things you have to do. You know, you have to check things. Now people are buying stuff online, right? Things are, you know, things are even through PA all the time. They've created um, bumper stickers for campgrounds now, right? To raise awareness about this insect to campgrounds. So, <clears throat> so to wrap it up, um, I'm gonna talk for a minute about New York and make IMAP invasives, um, dot org. Do you guys know about IMAP invasives? I know Mike does. IMAP Invasives is a database, okay? And they have an app that you can literally put on your phone. It's very simple to use. <coughs> but this is just the, if you, so first off, 
go to New York IMAP invasives because all different states, a lot of different states have IMAP, okay? Go to New York IMAP invasives and this is the cover sheet, right? So you log in, you just go and you log in and you can create a password and you are then into the system. They have tutorials under resources, they have back um, field guides, they have all kinds of training. You can watch tutorials on how to use it. But um, it's a really great thing. So if I'm out kayaking or if I'm out walking and I have this app on my phone, I turn the app on. If I see giant hogweed, for instance, I'll take a picture of it and I'll, the GPS in my phone will register where I saw it. When I get back home and I have Wi-Fi, um, or you, if you have your Wi-Fi on, which I usually don't, um, you go back home, you download it, and you put it into the database. And what that actually does in the instance for giant hogweed it goes right to the biologist in New Paltz. It goes to her phone. She gets triggered that you found giant hogweed somewhere because that's how serious it is. And someone will go and look at that. You know, they'll reach out to you <coughs> and they'll say, you know, what was it? You got more pictures? Because you can take a couple pictures on this. Um, so any other time, if you take a picture of an invasive and you report it, it goes onto the map, right? So you can go under giant hogweed here and you can see where all the infestations of giant hogweed are in New York State. So it's really awesome. And it's a really good management tool that scientists use. And it's also a way of, when you see a fact sheet about an invasive species and there's a distribution map that shows you where it is in the state, that's how they make those maps by observations on IMAP. So this doesn't go to a black hole somewhere. Your information that you put in there actually goes to Albany. And they actually have people that will go out and look at this, you know, look at the pictures and go and confirm it or, you know, say it is or it isn't. <clears throat> so it's an awesome, it's an awesome tool. It's early detection, rapid response. It's citizen science. It gets us all active. We don't have to be scientists, right? We don't have to know everything about all the science of everything. But this is a tool that we can use. It's great for kids. Teachers are, we're doing a teacher training tomorrow at my office um, for some DEC curriculum. And we're gonna, you know, kids, students can do this. They can have a, a group on here. And classrooms can go out and work with this. So it's really, really cool. And that's all, that's all I have. And I don't think I went over, did I? No, I didn't, good. Yeah. Right, good question. So, you know, you're 80 years old, you got a tree that falls in your house, you call somebody, they come and cut it down for you and then they get to keep the wood, which is awesome. It's a good burn in wood. We burn it too at home. Um, but so 50 miles, you can't carry wood 50 miles, right? So I can't take wood to the Adirondacks. <clears throat> so the thing that used to be 50 miles for the Emerald Ash Borer, but Emerald Ash Borer, it's everywhere now, right? So I think they've, I'm not sure what the range is now, but it's more than 50 miles. But when they say don't move firewood, 50 miles was the, was the window of space. So a lot of people, well, we want people to have better management practices and not move their wood somewhere far away. Um, but now with the emerald ash borer, it's not so much where is emerald ash borer, now it's like, okay, now how are we managing it? Because now it's here, it's like zebra mussels, right? It's here, we, now we have to manage it. So that's a good question though. Yep. Right, so I don't know if they heat treat that, right? Some places are heat treating, wood pellets are heat treated, pellets are now heat treated, so if there's larva in pellets. So um, I'm not sure how they're doing it. They're cutting all the trees down off the throughway, right? You see them all the time, they take it away or they mulch it and leave it right there. I don't, I don't see, a lot of times on the throughway, I live in Henrietta and I drive to Geneva and um, I see they just leave the mulch, so. You know, but that's a good point, and that's how invasive spread, right? That's what happens, right? So you have to think like the invasive. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
Right. So, you know, the, she just said on the way on the throughway and on the way to Batavia, all these dead trees, those are ash trees. If you, if you look at that, those are ash trees. And, you know, when I brought it up, I have friends that aren't environmentally minded. So I'm like, oh, invasive species. They're like, what is that? I'm like, you don't know what that is? But when I say, when I tell them about emerald ash borer, and then they start driving around, they're like, oh, my gosh, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? Yes, yes, yes. Right? And they're dying from the top. So if they do aerial, you know, drone or anything over forest, they can see the trees are dying from the top, right? From the crown. It is changing the chemistry and the makeup of our forest for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, they're trying to cut those trees down on the throughway. But think about it. That takes, that's, that's man hours. That's money. That's time, right? So, but they don't want them falling on people. They don't want them falling on cars. So, but that's when you see it, it's all emerald ash borer damage, the ash trees. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Appreciate oh, yeah. Yeah. I just kill them <laughs> and flush them down the toilet. I kill them in a tissue and put them in the toilet. Yeah. Or my cat eats them. Yeah. But I don't take them, you know, like you know, Buddha and put it outside alive. I just don't do that with stink bugs. No, no, no. Right? right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you. Yeah, one more? Yeah. Yes, Mike. I don't know the answer to that. Do you know the answer to that? Yeah, it is here, yeah. You did, yeah. You sprayed? Yeah. Did you do it or did you have someone come and spray? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, if we tell people how to look for it, right, then, you know, call someone and they'll tell you how to treat it on your own property. Yeah, so take the information for sure. Oh, look at they've got one of these right in town. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. And that's some of the same pictures that I that I have. Yep. And you can see that aerial picture in here, all of the hemlocks that are dying. I mean, it's just, it's horrible. And I do have, um, I have hemlock woolly adelgid here. I have these pamphlets. Okay. And then I also have um, the initiative, the HWA initiative. And there's all kinds of great information. And they have lots of stuff going on. They have like, you can go out for a paddle and just look for hemlock trees. And you can look for, um, for the infestations, so they're very active with volunteers too. So if you wanted to participate, I'm sure there's opportunity, for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. If people that aren't here, can where can they go? So we at the Prism, we have resources. Okay, so organizations call us all the time, schools and all, the, all kinds of organizations call us and say, hey, can you give us some handouts? Can you give us some outreach materials? Or hey, can you come and do a presentation like you got in touch with us to do the presentation? Um, so we do supply people with resources, for sure. Yep. Yeah, like for libraries and all that stuff. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, folks. Thank you very much. So my name is uh, Brian Eschenauer, and I work with Cornell's Integrated Pest Management Program. And uh, we're going to pick up um, where we left off there, talking about invasive plants, but also the good news, um, talking about some invasive, 
plants and the native plants that can be used as a, a substitute for some of the invasives. So, um, well, let me just get started and, and talk about why why we're talking about native plants. I've kind of hinted at it at the first presentation, but um, let's look at this. So, native plants are really good uh, food sources for our native insects. So. Um, a plant like an oak tree has over 500 native insects that can feed on it, and that's a good thing. They don't kill the tree, but they nibble on it, and then birds can eat those insects, and it's part of the food web that's out there. And so a caterpillar like that that the bird is eating has probably fed on a native plant. So an oak tree can host about 500 different uh, native insects where something like a ginkgo, maybe there's five insects that could feed on that. It's not a bad plant, it's not an invasive, it's just not um, something that's native and our native plants are native insects and birds don't feed on it. Often the native plants are really well adapted to our area and require less water and care. They provide shelter for food and wildlife. And if you have um, a, an, uh, an ash tree in your landscape that was killed by the emerald ash borer, and it's in an area that's not that doesn't have a target. It doesn't have a sidewalk or a driveway, uh, but it's in a back area that could be left, and that's a good habitat for a lot of different insects and birds like woodpeckers. So um, there is, you know, the upside. We are seeing more woodpeckers because they eat the emerald ash borer larva, and a lot of the native plants have a uh, good natural uh, beauty. So native plants are important. Um, and you know, they, they feed the insects. We're hearing more about the insect populations that are on the decline. And some of this has really just hit the media over the last year or so. And um, entomologists, the folks that study insects are really trying to figure out what's going on. But, you know, in our own way, when we're planting native plants, we can help the insect population. And these are the beneficial insects, not the invasive ones uh, that we're talking about. And I like uh, this picture. It was a little story. So this past, um, well, it was last year uh, in September, I was at uh, an old growth forest where I volunteer a little bit, and somebody knows my background in pest management and they brought me this leaf and they said what is going on here uh, you know it's feeding on one of our really big trees here um, what can we do and you know nothing is wrong this is exactly what we want trees to do a little bit of feeding like this is not going to harm a large tree this is nature uh, doing its work and I took this picture just uh, a couple of days ago in my own yard so does anyone know what this is here? Anything about it? It This is a, a red bud. So this is a, a red bud. It's a native. And they self-seed, but they're not invasive. And this, these perfect little circles here, are due to a leaf cutter bee. And so it's making that pattern on there. And I have uh, a lot of red buds, probably uh, eight or ten of them in the yard. But... Uh, only a couple of the trees have this. So again, it's just uh, a little bit of feeding that's not going to harm the trees. But the leafcutter bee is a very good pollinator, and it's a solitary bee, so it doesn't um, create a nest. There's no sting uh, danger involved with the leafcutter bee. And they take that piece that they cut out intact, and they put it in to a little hole they create where they rear um, their young. So they have like one or two in each hole. Anyway, uh, so there's some good things that go on with native plants and insects. And, um, you know, I'm not somebody who says, oh, everything has to be native. We can't have anything that's not native. Um, I think uh, they can work together. We just don't want those invasive plants that can create a big problem. And this is Somebody at uh, Cornell, the Urban Horticulture Institute, Nina is an expert, and she said, you know, appropriate plants uh, may be native or non-native. And, um, 
you can have something that is native to the region, but if it doesn't fit in that site, it still could be a poor choice. So matching the plant to the site is important. And there's some research to say mixing some natives and non-natives can really benefit the pollinators. We, our goal for a lot of the pollinators and butterflies is to have bloom throughout the growing season. So always avoid the non-native invasive ones. And New York State is one of several states that enacted some legislation back in 2015 that um, banned and prohibited uh, certain plants. Uh, so um, it became illegal to sell, import, or purchase some plants. Most of these are weeds, and we wouldn't even think about it, but some of them were common in the nursery trade. And uh, among these are Norway maple, burning bush, and barberry. About 20 years ago, um, the people who manage our street trees stopped planting Norway maples. They knew that we just have so many of them. And I have one in my yard that is very large. And because, I, you know, if you have these, any of the plants on this list, don't worry. Uh, this is not going to happen. <laughs> um, or I would have been arrested a long time ago. Um, it just, we just don't want any more out there. There's plenty of them. Um, and all of them self-seed and can cause a problem. I worked on a project uh, after this legislation came out to um, have a list of appropriate substitutes. And before I did it, it's like, okay, are all these, you know, really invasive? I'm a skeptic by nature. And uh, I just went out on some hikes that I do and started to look around. And this one was down there in the Finger Lakes region. And it was in the springtime. This is barberry. It's a real big problem in a lot of New England. And uh, as I looked around, uh, there were other plants too. So I'm standing in one location. I saw the Norway maple there uh, next to the barberry and honeysuckle all right there. I didn't even have to move to see it. And this was in the fall. And this is right across from uh, Bristol Mountain in that area. And there is a barberry, just one plant so far. But this is Japanese barberry, and that can be a really big problem. We like Japanese barberry in the landscape. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different cultivars of that. It was very common. Now it is one of those banned species because it produces these fruit, which aren't a problem until the birds eat them. This is in Highland Park, and there's a barberry. And then they deposit them. And I took this picture um, in the Poughkeepsie area in the springtime, and this is barberry. This is in uh, Connecticut, and they did some research in Connecticut, and they found that uh, not only does it choke out the native plants, it also creates an environment that's really good for ticks, because ticks like the humidity underneath that canopy, and they found that uh, they can have 120 ticks infected with Lyme disease where they have Japanese barberry, and only 10 ticks uh, per acre without the Japanese barberry. So another reason we don't want to have these invasive plants like Japanese barberry. And they can recover if uh, the time and effort and money is spent to remove barberry. Uh, the woodlands can recover, and they found that they can reduce uh, the Lyme-infected ticks by about 80%. So that's the good news. Uh, this is a publication that we put out in 2015 when that legislation came out, and this is available now online. And it looks like this if you get to the site. So if you put in uh, alternatives to invasives, Cornell into Google, you'll get this uh, site right at the top of your search there. And we're um, constantly adding to this as we find new good plants or people suggest plants. And this publication was vetted by people from all throughout New York State. Naturalists looked at this to make sure that we had uh, a good solid list and plants that weren't invasive. Most everything on here is native, however. And so Japanese barberry, we know this is a problem. It is banned now. Um, but it had these uh, cultivars that had some really nice color to them. So uh, without it anymore, what else might you choose as a substitute? 
Well, there's a native plant called nine bark, and some varieties of it also have uh, a good burgundy color like this. There's a standard one that's called Diablo that you can find in the nursery, and there's a newer one that's dwarf that's called uh, Little Devil. And I happened to be out at in Chicago at the Morton Arboretum, and I took these photos. And this was in a demonstration garden to show different hedges, uh, different types of plants that you could make a hedge out of. And they had both of these there. And uh, it kind of looks good when it's in flower. I took this in uh, Rochester here. And there are also yellow cultivars. And uh, there are nine barks that also have yellow. This is one that's called Darts Gold. Oh. And uh, we also have bottle brush buckeye as uh, an alternative here. And this is in Highland Park. And uh, this is a really big plant. What's that? Durand Eastman Park. Oh, yeah, a really nice one. You can see, even as you're driving by Durand Eastman Park, you can see that one. And so a nice summer bloom, which is not common. Most of our shrubs are blooming in the springtime. And this is one that has a, uh, that eventually can get to be, you know, 12 feet tall, but starts out small. It's not easy for them to sell in um, the nurseries because it doesn't look like much when you're buying it. It's just a stem or two. It takes a while for it to get established in the landscape. Give it time. I think it'll take, I think so. I think it'll take some, uh, yeah. This one is probably 100 years old over in uh, Highland Park. And I, my dog is there for scale, uh, who is along for the ride. But my wife says, tell him he's a corgi. So, you know, uh, he's a small dog anyway. Anyway, there it is. You can see how it got the name, Bottle Brush Buckeye, right? And it is related to, um, the, uh, the tree buckeye as well, the horse chestnut. Another good native shrub is the button bush. And take a look at these flowers. And there are some native ones in Seneca Park, not too far from here, right uh, near the water. This is not that picture, but uh, this picture I took there later in the season after the blooms when there are actually seed balls at that time. Um, and yeah, they're naturally found near wet areas, but they're finding this can do really well in dry sites as, as well, even though in its native habitat is often next to uh, water or wetlands. But uh, butterflies are attracted to this. It's a good pollinator plant. Here it is um, at, at Cornell on their campus by their ag quad. Uh, a pretty large shrub here uh, went in a few years ago. And this is later in the summer with some nice flowers that are just starting to fade. Chokeberry is another uh, good plant. This is a good alternative to the burning bush because it has this nice fall color to it with um, these berries that are attractive to birds. But it's a, a native plant and it has uh, some good um, blooms on in the springtime as well. Next, we've got uh, American Holly, Ilex opaca. So this is actually native to New York. It wasn't, it's not very common here. It's very common in Ohio, in the woodlands in the southern part of Ohio. But uh, we're lucky we can grow it here. We're close enough to the lake that uh, conditions here allow for it. We're in zone six. In Ithaca, with the colder temperatures in midwinter, they have trouble growing this and they're a little bit jealous that we can have some really nice American holly here. And there are male and female plants for this, and the females produce these nice uh, fruit if you have a male around to give the pollen for that. And uh, there's deciduous hollies as well that uh, lose their leaves, and when they drop their leaves, uh, they look like this. This is on the corner of my yard, so really nice, especially with the snow and we need to see a little bit of color in midwinter, 
the birds will eventually strip every one of those berries. Um, I don't think it's a favorite, but when they need it later in the winter, it's there for them. It's with the snow on it and the dog. <laughs> so uh, inkberry holly is another holly that um, is an evergreen that can do pretty well. In the most exposed spots, we might lose some foliage on this one uh, over the winter, but it'll uh, bounce right back from that. But uh, it's a nice uh, substitute for something like Taxus that is not native. This is a native holly species that's evergreen. And I, I think this is my favorite. I have this, uh, I put it in a few years ago, and I'm really impressed with it every year. This is Apothergilla. I think it just needs a new name, something that's a little easier to remember. But uh, there it is in the springtime. This is a close-up of the flowers on it. Uh, it's a reliable bloomer. It can take shade, uh, full sun for us here. And uh, yeah, this is uh, one in my yard, rhododendron next to it there. And uh, this is one that was a little bit younger, but it always gets a really nice fall color. The color changes depending on the conditions we have that year, but uh, most years it gets an, a nice red color to it. What family is um, I'm not sure of the family. It's just, I, it's uh, alone in its genus. It's Fothergilla, the garden eye. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is native to parts of New York, but it isn't something that's very common around this part of the state. Um, um, it'll be, it'll grow slower. Yeah, you've seen it in, do you? Yeah, and uh, it's more commonly available. You know, a few years ago, you wouldn't have heard of this. There's a variety that has blue foliage to it that uh, has the waxy bloom, kind of like a blue spruce. Fall color there. And yeah, this is just over the last uh, uh, year. Another one that is a, a summer a bloomer is oak leaf hydrangea. They're just starting to bloom right now. Who has oak leaf hydrangea? A bunch of you do. It's a great one, isn't it? Um, so you know about that big, bold foliage uh, and really good fall color. This is in, at uh, Highland Park again, and uh, foliage changes. That year it looked really good that I was, I was taking that. Yeah, it can get big. There are dwarf varieties of the native hydrangea portfolio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can cut it right back. No problem. Yeah, the deer pruned ours, and then we had to prune it. Okay. And I replaced my barber. Oh, good. All right. Good for you. Yeah. Um. The northern bayberry is something we don't see around here too much. It is native uh, to New York. This is a good one. It has deer resistance to it. Uh, also, like the holly, there are male and female plants. The female plants will produce these berries, and they have the waxy coating on them that you could make the bayberry candles out of. The, the foliage and those berries are very fragrant, as you would expect because it's a, a bay uh, plant. This can be found in coastal areas, and it has a good salt tolerance to it. So if it's near a roadway where it's getting some of the de-icing salts, you'll see a good uh, ability to withstand the salts. It's uh, evergreen in most years. In the most severe winters, the foliage might brown, but new uh, foliage will come out in the spring without a problem. Uh, again, in Highland Park, it, there, since it's been there for decades and decades, the trees are, are really big. I 
dog was on the walk there too. <laughs> All right, uh, red twig dogwood. This is another good. Who grows red twig dogwood? You know, this has been around in the trade for a while. Uh, so it has these blooms in the spring. You really don't grow it for that. Um, but this is where this one really shines. The uh, the red twigs that are there, uh, a native plant, and uh, it looks good. Uh, to keep the red uh, stems as vibrant as this, it's best to cut it back to prune out portions of it or to cut the whole thing back about 18 inches and let it shoot up the new growth, which will have that red color. You don't have to do it every year, but uh, it does help to do it. So I was down in uh, Henrietta near the Genesee River there this spring, and I saw a native stand of it there right near the water. And it's real common. This is a place where you'd find it in its native habitat, but it can do well in most any condition in the landscape. Another native plant for us is, are the rhododendrons. They can do pretty well, I've, except for the deer browsing. Ironically, can grow some really good rhododendrons with the well-drained soil in this part of uh, the county. But uh, it, here again, that's in Highland Park, and there's some good varieties there. Flame azalea, which is native to parts of the state. Um, there's fragrant sumac which is a nice one that is a native. So this is a low grow plant and it is deciduous so it will lose its leaves. Just have the, the stems there. Um, and they put this in at the Costco in bulk. So it's a native plant that they put in there but that whole hillside is covered with fragrant low grow sumac. So glad they chose a native plant. I'd like a little more diversity personally, but uh, uh, this one, some landscapers are rethinking putting it in on mass because it does trap things that blow around, leaves and then uh, garbage. And so it's kind of a filter. And then you have to look at that if it's not being maintained. So um, there was actually a planting near uh, Highland Avenue and Highland Park and they took it out because it was such a trap for, um, for garbage. So something to keep in mind. Something that I don't have experience with but is a good native is the uh, sweet fern. And uh, this is kind of a, a low-growing shrub that has this fern-like foliage. And um, it's being used in a lot of different areas, even along parking lot uh, locations. So I want to try this myself can see how it uh, gets the name the fern part and apparently the foliage when it's crushed has a good scent to it. Does anybody here grow sweet fern? Not yet. It uh, can take uh, a good amount of light but it's normally grown in the shade. Witch hazels are a good native shrub that can be a substitute for some of the invasives and there are the ones that are native um, like this and then there are a lot of hybrids with some of the European uh, species but they flower in late winter mostly some early early spring and the blooms on all of them look something like this there's a variation in the color and this is when the temperatures are above freezing when they're below freezing these long petals curl up and um, when it is above freezing they smell really good. It's um, They made the astringent witch hazel out of um, this plant. Are there di are they different species? I, Do you? I just yeah, that. yeah, because there are so many cultivars and species oh, and hybrids. So Two different ones, yeah. it's possible. Okay. And the bloom times are different on them, and 
it's it's really good to have you have a picture oh here it is being used as a hedge it's good to have it in a location where you're not going to miss the bloom because if it's way in the backyard it could go into bloom and come out before the snow melts and you're back there to see it so this was a good sighting for one this is at uh, in Brighton's uh, library along Elmwood Avenue there right near the sidewalk and you're when you walk along the sidewalk in late winter you can smell the fragrance of this uh, witch hazel that's sighted pretty close to the, the main door there and here it is in Highland Park not sure if this is a native species or not but uh, there it's just showing the variation you can get in color Well, to help the monarchs, a native plant that uh, does well is a butterfly milkweed. And this is Asclepius tuberosa. The tubers are referring to the swollen roots that this has. It's with able to, it's, uh, makes it uh, able to withstand droughts. Flowers have a lot of nectaries, which the butterflies really like. It is a milkweed but not an aggressive spreader at all, like the wild milkweed that's really useful for monarch butterflies. Um, but this one is very well behaved in the garden. And it's, you're starting to see it bloom. So, um, I was traveling to Albany yesterday. I was coming back, and sometimes I can see it along the, the throughway there with the initial blooms. But it'll bloom through August. Uh, it's just a shot. So this is in, um, well, it's right off the thruway on your way to Geneva. And this I took in 2016 during the drought. You can see the grasses were all uh, dead. Uh, you know, they died back. The roots were fine. And this plant, because it has those water storage roots, was doing just fine. I pulled over to the side of the road to take that picture. And... Uh, then uh, I found that I'm not an entomologist, but those I, you know, are the monarch uh, butterfly caterpillars. So here's a native plant doing just what it should, providing the food source for the monarch. And that those insects will not kill that plant. They're going to eat some of the foliage, um, and uh, you know, go into a cocoon and become a monarch and fly south. Just another shot of that. And then, yeah. So I don't see this self seed very much, but uh, it can, and it does in the wild, just like those shots. And this is, it is different from this. If you have the space and the patience to uh, deal with this one, it's great also for the monarchs. Another uh, native that, um, like is this um, Heuchera, Villosa, and Americana. Both of them are native, and uh, they're pretty hardy and have a late, this is a, a fall-blooming, this is the Villosa fall-blooming um, perennial. And this is a selection of Heuchera Americana. got moss flax which is a nice um, perennial that has an evergreen foliage to it and there are the flowers and here it is along our driveway so it's pretty tolerant of de-icing salts that just naturally melt there and accumulate along the hedge and that's a privet hedge one of the invasives still that was planted there by somebody else um, but this is one where st I'm starting to see it out there uh, being used more in big plantings. Uh, it can take uh, really harsh conditions. It's sometimes used in rock gardens. And uh, here, I took this a couple years ago. This is up at the port of Rochester. And big plantings of it right there. That's the Charlotte Lighthouse. And uh, there you can see it in the foreground. 
And so it's native for us, but uh, they're really appreciating this one in uh, Japan right now. And uh, here it is. This isn't Fuji, um, a festival that they have there. And the Fuji Mountain is in the background. You know, so we have the Lilac Festival, which is not native here, but uh, they have uh, this festival uh, that started about 10 years ago. And, uh, yeah, somebody, does somebody have a yard they could do a small-scale version of this around here? Um, so, yeah, that was the moss flocks. This is another one, another flox that uh, is uh, a nice one. This is the wild blue uh, flocks. And uh, I have a few of these in, and pretty impressive. It only blooms in the springtime, but um, it holds its own. And it's a good, good native to have in there. Uh, the Christmas fern has that name because it's evergreen. I took this in Washington Grove. And uh, here it is, Abraham Lincoln Park this past winter. Uh, you can see the snow is melting there. So that's over towards Webster there. Good native plant that's evergreen. And yeah, we need some evergreen perennials around through the winter. There's ostrich fern that spreads you, everyone who knows. <laughs> but it's it's reasonable. You can deal with it. It's not invasive. Yeah, it'll take up as much space as you're willing to give to it. Oh, and these are uh, edible fiddleheads. Have you heard about eating fiddleheads? The ostrich fern is one that um, you can eat them without... Some of them you have to boil and change the water a couple times. This one, you don't have to do that. I had some the spring from some ostrich fern in our garden. Get them when they're about six inches uh, tall. And it tastes a little bit like asparagus. But probably will never catch on too bigly. <laughs> uh, sensitive fern, this one really likes wet conditions. This would be hard to grow in a drier site. And it has that name because it's sensitive to the frost in the fall. And as soon as it gets anywhere near 32, it, it dies right back. But it has these uh, places where it uh, forms its spores, and they stick up above the snow. Kind of interesting. All right. And uh, I, how are we doing on time? 6.30. OK. Okay, well, I'll go give a few more slides, and, um, and then we can wrap up. I, I put in, I didn't know if our previous speaker was going to talk about spotted lanternfly, so I have a few uh, slides of that in here, and I'm just going to show um, one image that you haven't seen yet, um, because when I was talking about spotted lanternfly back in January, somebody in the audience said, oh, you know, I was down in Pennsylvania at my nephew's house, and he found a way to deal with them. You can't tell that they're all on the tree here until you take a close look. Can you see the clusters? He was using a shop vac to suck them up. That's what he's got there, and he's in that tree. Uh, so yeah, we want to really know about this. And it is easily recognizable, so keep your eyes out for it. There was a garden center in Monroe County that uh, when they brought in Christmas trees, they happened to be from that part of Pennsylvania, and they found, I think, 30 or 40 dead spotted lanternfly on the ground. This was right before Christmas when they came in and they started to recognize what was there. The concern is that they may have laid eggs on those trees, and those trees were put outside. And so we're keeping a close eye out for the spotted lanternfly. And you heard all about that before. And so um, native grasses. So ornamental grasses caught on, you know, in the 80s and 90s, and we started to appreciate the grasses in the landscape. There are now a lot of good uh, native grasses that we can choose. and. Uh, they attract songbirds. Um, they also provide food.
food for caterpillars and 75 butterflies. I wouldn't think of native grasses as providing this type of thing, but they also are habitat for birds and native bees. In the old foliage, the birds, uh, the native bees will um, make their nest in these tiny hollow stems. Generally, they're pest resistant and uh, low maintenance. And some of the grasses have roots that go down about six feet into the ground and they break up the subsoil and they can tap into the water that's in that subsoil so they can really improve soil conditions. First one is big blue stem and it is really big. It can be eight to ten feet tall and um, here is big blue stem with these volunteers here weeding the bed and this is little blue stem in the front there and little blue stem can be six feet tall so it's only little in relative uh, to big blue stem and we have some stands of uh, little blue stem right nearby this is in rush the oak openings who's been to all right yeah Good. A lot of you have been. Uh, we don't see that. I don't see that too often when I talk about this. But uh, Little Blue Stem is down there. And so this is an area, this is a pocket prairie that we have here that was never forested. The bedrock is close to the soil surface and um, trees don't grow well there. And we have our own little prairie there. And these did occur in spots through western New York. Um, and you know, in the Buffalo region, they say there probably were the Native American bison there at one time that would feed on these. So these were a food source for uh, bison. And it's starting to be recognized as a good plant for the landscape. So they're talking about the features of Little Blue Stem in that horticulture magazine. Here's a couple shots of it in the landscape. In the winter, it has some winter interest. And there are a lot of varieties. I should take some more pictures, but some of them are really upright and they all have uh, some interesting fall color to them as well. So a little blue stem is a good choice. Here's one that I really like too um, that is uh, called prairie drop seed. Here it is in its native habitat. That picture is actually up in Canada. Um, but here's a couple shots of it. So it's a good grass for a hillside where you might not be able to mow. It also has a little bit of fall color to it, but uh, here it is. This is at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, and they chose an area rather than mowing this area. It's a big lawn area. They didn't want trees or shrubs there to obscure the buildings, but uh, they went with a low maintenance grass and they put um, this uh, prairie drop seed in there in a big swath. Nice shot of it there. Here it is uh, at Cornell Botanic Gardens, and uh, I happened to be down there in July when it was in bloom, and the blooms for this grass are fragrant. So people say it smells like uh, popcorn. Um, it, it smells good, and you could, I could smell it uh, walking by there. I took a, some close-up shots of the flowers, but they mixed it in a mixed perennial border right near uh, a parking area there in a swale. And I talked about red bud and the leaf cutter bee. Here's a couple shots of red bud with its heart-shaped leaves, another good native plant. And serviceberry, who grows serviceberry? Great. It's one of the first trees to bloom in the springtime, just covered with white. So this is a good substitute for uh, the Bradford or calorie pear. And if you've grown them, you've probably tasted some of them, right? Oh, really? Birds are loving that yeah. Yeah. So I put in one. Good. Yeah. I'd recommend serviceberry. I have one right in the corner of my front yard and I I eat I sometimes I beat the birds to it and I eat the, the fruit and they're actually down in the Finger Lakes they're looking at starting to cultivate uh, this as a uh, a fruit that uh, they sell. So it can take partial shade. Yeah. It's a small tree. Reminder, thriving in full sun. Yeah. 
Yeah, they can take full sun, but also can do well in the shade. It's kind of an understory and edge of the wood type of plant. There's a shot of the fruit that are, they kind of taste like a blueberry. They're growing fast though. Yeah, yeah. Um, spice bush is another native that is a host. This is a, the last plant we're going to talk about. And, you know, that looks like a bird dropping, right? Yeah. But it's actually the spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Um, and it feeds on the leaves of this. I would call this a shrub, small tree or a shrub. Um, and that is the spice bush uh, butterfly. I have the spice bush in, but I haven't seen the caterpillar butterfly yet. Still waiting for that. Just put that in a couple years ago. To get the fruit, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, our Monroe County Soil and Water Conservation Office was selling uh, seedlings of this. And so it's a really inexpensive way to get a bunch. And when you get a bundle of them, um, you're certainly going to get some male and some female. Yes. Yep. So that that is an understory plant that can take shade but it can also take full sun. Okay, good. Yes, so starting in like this, maybe earlier they have a, their list online and then you place your order a few months in advance and then you pick it up in the springtime very inexpensive way to get a lot of good native plants. Yeah. So that wraps up um, my presentation. Happy to take a couple questions. Yeah? With the holly, if you don't really want a whole bunch of them, how, how do you tell if, if when you need a male and a female, how do you, how do you tell that you... Uh, yeah, so they are propagating those vegetatively. Um, so you can buy a known male variety. So they take cuttings of a male, and then you'll know you can buy uh, a male or a female one. Otherwise, yeah, it is, like if it's just a seedling, you don't know until it reaches a certain size and st starts to flower if it's a male or female. So there is, I'm not sure if it's native, but it's not invasive, and that's the uh, climbing hydrangea. Yeah, that could be Virginia. Yeah, that's, Virginia creeper will go crazy. I have some of that, and it's okay, but <laughs> you have to be ready to keep it in check. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've heard that works, um, that's a good deterrent. Some of it depends on the deer pressure and, um, you know, how hungry they are. Okay. And there are, there are definitely sprays that uh, you can use, and I think with those, it's the sulfur compounds that are in there and that's what's in you know uh, predator urine that you can put out so there's something 
that the deer can detect. And it, it can work. Um, uh, human hair, I think, is another one. So putting in that. Uh, people go to barber shops where they sweep it up and put it in bags like that, too, or spread it around. But, yeah, I, it's, it's hard because these are native plants. The population, the wildlife biologists tell us that the population of deer have never been this high. When North America was mostly forested, it wasn't good habitat for deer. We've created an artificial environment so the deer population is unnaturally high. And um, consequently, our native plants don't have resistance to that amount of deer, high deer populations. Yeah. It's a difficult problem. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and a special thanks to Brian and Patty for sharing their knowledge. Um, the other thing I'd like to ask is, uh, again, with the Arundaquite Conservation um, Board, we do have a Facebook page, so we'd appreciate it if you all went and looked at it and liked it. Um, this is the fourth series of events that we've had. Uh, we will not have one next month, but we're going to have something in um, in um, September. So please like us and look for stuff that we post. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this special event coverage on ICAT, Government Access.